Hello everyone. Today we are going to do a fast and loose tonalist watercolor painting. We're going to use a limited palette uh, which is going to consist of Venetian red. If you don't have that, don't worry, you can use light red oxide. Uh, sap green. If you don't have that, you could probably mix burnt umber and a viridian. Uh, we have a little bit of ultramarine blue, uh, Payne's gray, and phthalo blue. Ooh, you could probably mix um, phthalo green and burnt umber to get a uh, sap green as well. So, without further ado, in front of me I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. 100% cotton, um, 140 pound cold press. I just uh, super saturated it. I'm going to use my medium hake brush, but you can use different sizes. You can use um, squirrel mops, just kind of something large, probably even um, a flat brush, just to apply the paint and to have fun and push it around. The main thing we're going to focus on is um, an oil painting approach that's um, utilized and demonstrated by uh, Stuart Davies, Dennis Sheehan, uh, David Usher, painters like that on YouTube, some contemporary painters, um, and they use it in the oil manner. But they'll take a mixture of the red and the green, which will have browns in it, because of the mix, it'll have the red, it'll have the green, and they will very loosely and very quickly create a scene. Um, it involves big brush, uh, paper towel being lifted, etc. And here is just adopting that technique to watercolor, where you'll find that we can do the lifting the scraping, a lot of the things that they'll utilize in oil painting in watercolor. Um, scene wise, I do have, I think, a little bit of ideas, like maybe I want a light of a sky right here or something like that. But other than that, I'm just, uh, Letting loose, applying pigment, and if there's something I don't like, I can wipe it back with a paper towel. This will give you practice with the wet and wet stage, with brush strokes, um, with controlling the moisture on the paper paper towel, texture techniques. You see how I'm just simply taking a paper towel and just dabbing. And at the heart of it, it's gonna look antiqued, old master, um, you know, something from the 1800s but um, that's because of how close the tones are together. Or, I don't know if it's so much the tones as it is, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm not good with the, the professional language of it, of it. It might be like chroma. There is um, other terminology like key, like high key and low key where um, I can get into that in a moment. And that's where I kind of thrive talking. So I'm still waking up. My allergies are getting me today. And I'm not quite sure what it is. So I'm going to have a water here stream when I do this I'm stretching out my paper 
because my paper is absorbing water and it's going to want to buckle. Uh, some people utilize 300 pound paper uh, as a way to you know deal with um, that buckling because of the weight. This is going to be the buildup of the background. Anyway, 100% um, cotton will be, I found, less resistant to buckling or can handle more abuse in this fashion. You see how once I start marking over this spot, it's not really wet, and wet anymore. That is due to the fact that I had lifted the water out of that region. And if I wanted to go back into that and get that watery effect, I could soften the edges I could come back in with a brush, get some more water there, because inherently there's going to be water with that pigment. I'm just going to keep going. This technique is very good for also um, a meditative process where you just let yourself create and let loose especially since we're not working from a photograph or um, a scene. But you can readily adapt this to uh, a photograph or a scene. And if you have cats in the house that are stressing you out because they knock stuff over every video, that'll help you relax. In fact, I kid you not, I opened up the, room, the door for the art room. Hammy flew in ahead of me. Hopped right up onto one of the desks and um, I knocked off a metal box. <laughs> Not that it got spilled, but that was his first artistic expression of the day. So, anyway, so you see that we're developing this um, brownish, reddish, green scene. I'm starting to create a background now. And speaking of the background, you probably hear that rumbling. We have thunderstorms rolling through today. We can um, now probably talk about high key and low key. Um, during the 1800s, uh, there's different art movements. There was kind of the realism and the romanticism, I think, at the uh, beginning of the 1800s. And from there stemmed tonalism and expressionism, where the attributes were being able to see brush strokes. Um, and the Impressionism, and I'm, I'm going very, like, short into it. Impressionism was very bright and cheery, usually. While tonalism was very um, darker and contemplative. So the darker everything kind of tied together in this fashion is more um, low-key, where if everything was bright and cheery and... Um, bright yellows and reds and stuff like that. I guess you would call that a high key type painting. I'm gonna take a rigger brush now. So this is a number one brick rigger. And you can add wet and wet trunks. And this will all soften up. And if we wanted to soften up even more, we could just come in and lift up along those edges. Now at this point, what I, once I have what I want within the painting, 
I have found that due to the tonal shift, meaning that things will dry softer, especially with this color combination, that I do need to um, rely on two or three more colors to kind of add a um, a little bit more darkness to it. And what I'll do is I'll take ultramarine and this will create a little bit darker purple. And I'll use this for far distant objects. I'm just stippling in foliage here. And this gives me a little bit more sense of um, depth as well. So I'll have the original, what's there. I'll have this second add-on of the ultramarine, which helps me with um, depth. And then as I work my way closer, I'm gonna wind up utilizing um, phthalo or thalo blue. Oh, that's too much ultramarine. I think I'll leave that and allow that to take place. I have a hole between the trees here and a hole between the trees here, which is totally fine, but I want to have them not to be completely in line. I want to have, you know, a variation in size. Um, so this little exercise, you'll start seeing things like that, where you could start experimenting with um, compositional shapes as well. So it's fast, it's loose, it lets you explore composition. You don't have to worry about getting color correct. You can do this with just simply um, burnt uh, umber, but this is kind of just a little bit more in-depth than maybe a solely burnt umber painting. I think I have a burnt umber painting up on YouTube. Um, I think we should do another one soon. I have a, a tendency to experiment quite a bit. I think at this point you'd probably know that. Um, but sometimes, and I was talking to Joe Menz about this, is that you can go down the rabbit hole of experimentation and then when you come back to watercolor or maybe you've been too far away from just basic painting sometimes it feels like you're relearning some aspects or something's a little bit different once you come back. I mixed phthalo blue in and this is to um, now change that greenish tone, change my dark tone and this is for my closer layer. Since this is still wet, especially the water, I'm going to lift up a few spots to have that light come down. And I don't think I'm going to add any more um, color value or anything to that water. Just let that subtle and I'll be there. You can always play with scraping in this one too. This is a great way to um, start incorporating cut up um, credit cards, hotel room key cards. Uh, you can get a lot of different effects with it. Ron Ranson was a big proponent of the scraping. Uh, Zoltan Zabo, in a lot of his books, he used um, a palette knife for scraping and for application of paint, which was interesting. I don't think that really gets used that much anymore. 
I don't know. If you use a palette knife in your watercolor painting, let me know. Uh, contemporary painters that use scraping a lot. I mentioned Joe Manza. He's very good at um, that aspect. Uh, I mentioned Stuart Davies. Uh, well, no. Stuart Davies will wipe back his oils. Um, David Usher will scrape. Um, Stephen Cronin will scrape. I believe uh, Rick S. has started adding scraping into some of his videos. I'm going to build up this density here. grab the number four rigger. I'm going to use this to grab a lot of pigment. And notice how I haven't even done a dry off. I think we'll try to stay away from doing a dry off so that it'll allow you to um, continue to go through the painting and see the different stages, the complete stages of wetness and how this uh, strip that I'm adding, these trees, how they are interacting with different areas. Um, a few things to keep in mind with pigment and painting wet and wet is that I want more pigment on the brush and less water on it. Otherwise, I will start um, getting the cauliflowers which might be something that you want an effect. Um, but gener uh, generally people will try to avoid that. Just put in a little shadow in. Helping grab these in place. Percy is digging around back there. She kind of adds the ASMR um, uh, sound effects to these videos, I would say. Notice how I have a difference in the distance between these. I'm going to take the dark on here, stipple in the underhang, the bottom of these. Underhang, overhang. Use that to texturize the foreground. A little more texture down here. I'll take the number one rigger. I'm trying not to vary the brushes too much in these videos but um the number four will hold so much pigment compared to the number one that it just makes it so much easier and then um i don't have the lightest hand so i use the number one for the thinner lines Let's get some sap green, yellow blue, Venetian red to mellow it out. So right now we've only used four colors plus the white of the paper. I'm doing this as a kind of um, uh, framing effect right there bringing in the darks on that side so that it stops the eye from going off the edge of the paper. Even though something like this is 11 by 15 and it would go underneath a, um, a mat that would kind of crop it some, 
Let's grab some uh, Payne's Gray now. We'll do a fifth color. It. Um, it's good to kind of paint to the edges. Just create the whole scene. It lets you figure out where you want to lay the mat exactly. It also lets you um, create elements that go on and off and um, just envision the whole world that you're creating, especially, you know, with just imagination. Trying to get super dark. Percy, what are you doing? Let's hand. Hold on a second. I'm not sure why. And uh, hopefully it's not like cause for alarm. But I think Hain has Haynes has always done this. This is taking that dark, accentuating. Down here. That if there's plastic of any type. Haynes will try to chew on it, and I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Just to reiterate, Haynes is a cat, but um, I don't know why he does it. She says that he does it because it's like a, it's a, st a stress thing, and he'll find any and all plastic, and usually we're really vigilant about picking up, you know, plastic or anything like that so if you've ever experienced that please let me know down below and um i'm sure the obvious solution is just be even more vigilant in regards to making sure that there's no sort of plastic wrapping of any kind but um that just now that he was doing was literally large sheets of um, mats, like uh, matting sheets that were covered in plastic. And he was kind of going to town on the edge of that. So it's um, so even things like that, you know, what he's finding. Anyway, I didn't mean to get. Um, quiet like that sorry about that so let's um accentuate this side of the painting so you see the number four rigor can give you thin lines like the number one this is number four right here this is number one um so definitely not necessary to have both does help me so you, you find out what you want to do um, palette wise um, pigment wise brush wise um, you're gonna want to find yourself a big brush to use either a hake or like I said a squirrel mop or a large flat you're gonna to want to find what works for you whether it's a, a rigger or um, I think some people will use more of a round smaller brush um, but the thing to keep in mind is that you know don't let anybody tell you what you can use and what you can't use there will be like if you want to do a competition they might say hey you can't use this, you can't use white or something like that. But from there, you know, you decide if you want to involve yourself in a competition or a culture or something that, that does that. And that, that's fine. But just remember, you can always, you're the ultimate decider with what you're doing. In fact, there's, um, I'm going to bring some branches off of this side. There's a skateboarder. And I'll do the longboarding and the surf skate stuff. I'm not like doing tricks or anything like that. 
but there's a longboarder, a uh, skateboarder that I like to watch. And he does a lot of YouTube videos. And some of his recent YouTube video was um, 10 skateboard tricks that that look the worst. It was like, look the worst, either because of the setup or how they feel, or um, just like the rotation just seems awkward, just things like that. Or talking about um, all those weird aspects. Anyway, he had, of course, mentions it said, you know, of course, never let anybody tell you what you can do and what you can't do skateboard wise on your skateboard, you know, what tricks you want to do, which of course, you know, is a really good method, a message. And, um, and his video was all in good fun. It was just based off of things that he had heard from other people. Cause it'd be funny. He would, um, introduce the trick and be like, oh, I love this trick. <laughs> and then he would say, here's why people don't like it. Uh, Johnny Geiger his name. Very um, infectious, happy personality. And you can see just how much he enjoys skateboarding and sharing his knowledge um, and experimenting. I think that's one thing that people don't really realize is that you know, skateboarding is an experimental culture as well. Just like painting, you know, form of self-expression. But ultimately, and I feel like now I'm going to start preaching. Make sure you're uh, you're doing stuff for your mind and for your body. You know, taking care of the health of both. With painting, it's very much for the mind in a few different ways. You're trying to solve a puzzle. You're getting your brain to work. You're using, and this is a very hard, rough translation of the uh, painter David LaFell, that even though we're painting something that we can see, you know, this is more abstract because we're using dots and dashes and lines to create the image. So our brains are working while we paint. Sometimes it's good to you know, shut off and play with it in this fashion, but it's good for your brain. But then also make sure you're doing something good for your body. You know, whether it's exercising, um, you're lifting weights, riding bicycles, going for walks. It's summer 2021. We had the horrible year of 2000. So we saw how much life could be limited and our um, availabilities to see our loved ones and friends and family, etc. So make sure you're making the most of this year. Make sure you're doing it safely. And I don't just mean with a mask or something like that. Make sure you're not um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that would be really dangerous then I have to say don't go and do that. Make sure you're not skateboarding I make sure you're not skateboarding without a helmet like going down a hill um, 30, 40, 50 miles per hour. <laughs> so live life but be safe. So I'm going to pause the camera in a moment for a dry off. Um, I'm going to do the wrap up first. Of course, you are always welcome to follow along with one of these tutorials. Uh, in fact, I encourage you to. You are more than welcome to uh, sell, to write your own name onto the artwork. 
you have my express permission. You could sell anything that you do whenever you follow one of my videos. I would love to see your results. You can hit me up on any of the social medias, the links down below. Of course, please like, subscribe, and follow. That helps this channel out. If you want to support the channel monetarily, there is the Patreon account. I have a lot of free access stuff on there. And, you know, um, if you have any questions, comments, don't hesitate. Uh, try to respond to everybody. And, you know, people say, hey, have you thought about doing this video or this video or how can I do this? And that gets my mind rolling. And then from there, uh, new content is created. So I have a very open door policy where you guys can come in and ask questions anytime. So let me pause for a dry off. And we'll see how it looks underneath the mat. All right, now that we are dried off, we have a big old mat right here. And that'll help. I'm gonna have to pick up the camera just to the frame. I'm gonna have to use a new mat sometime soon. But there you go. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day.